If you're over 40 and trying to get fit, it's not gonna happen because there's three things nobody tells you about. Learn these things and it will happen. Ooh, I'm curious where you're going. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I feel like this is close to home for me right now. I know. Well, we're all- we've New all considerations. Been, we've all been working out ourselves for a long time. We're all well over 40. Uh, you, Justin and I are in the Well, middle easy, there. easy. Some yeah. Of us, some whoa, of us are whoa, barely slowly over 40. Rolled. How, what are you at now? 40, you're 42, 43? 43. 43. Oh, you're in the middle now. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you, and you most, of our, most of our clients were in this age group, uh, I would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Were, Majority, I would say. Yeah. And what I want to open and start with by saying that the body never loses the ability to adapt to exercise. And when I say adapt, I mean all the great things that we want, right? Build muscle, get stronger, get leaner become more fit, like your body never loses the ability to improve itself with the proper application of exercise. In fact, even if we go in the much later years, there was a study that showed that people in their 70s could build muscle and strength just as well as people in their in their late 50s, early 60s. Uh -huh. Now, the difference is the the, the potential. Obviously, your, your top potential starts to drop as you get older, right? So you might not be able to do the crazy things you could do in your 20s when you're in your 40s, but most people in their 40s don't care about that. What they want is like fitness, health. They want to feel good, look good. Mm -hmm. And that's not just possible. It's uh, likely if you do the right things, but fitness for people over 40 isn't communicated properly. And I think, and I'll talk about the first one, and I know you guys know this one. Uh -huh. It just doesn't sound sexy, but I'm going to sell it right now because if you do this part right, it makes everything else 10 times more effective before you go let me because i don't know what they are right i haven't seen what you what you're going to say but i i without even knowing like the thing that i think is most interesting uh in what hopefully this aligns with where you're going is that these are very powerful lessons that uh even if you're 20 you need to know the difference is when you're 40 you have to know you have to mm -hmm. And I feel like, and I like, again, I don't know which direction you're going, but I'm assuming that the ones you're gonna you're gonna hit on are ones I wish I really paid attention to even in my 20s. <laughs> yes. But the truth is, if you don't, don't worry. The you intensity will, wasn't there. Though. You will have to. You yeah. will eventually have to learn this because you'll when when you get into your 40s, I feel like these things you you can't get away with the same way you could in your 20s. Hundred percent online or what? Yes, dude. Hundred okay. percent. So the first one is that mobility. And mobility work yeah. is uh, the priority. It's number one. And if you look at the data on people uh, attempting to improve their fitness uh, over the age of 40, and even people who've been working out for decades who then get into their 40s, the number one thing that stops them, besides just not going to the gym, although this contributes to that, is injury, pain, uh, the inability to do their favorite exercises or, or workouts. And mobility work solves that. Mobility work prevents any of those roadblocks from happening. And mobility work allows you to take advantage of the most effective exercise. Like I can't tell you how many times I would talk to people in their forties who have been working out for, for a long time and just didn't understand this. And they would say things to me like, Oh man, I used to love squatting. <laughs> like squatting was such a great exercise, but I, I haven't squat. I, have, I had to stop five years ago because yeah. knee back, whatever, or yeah, I used to love deadlifting, but I can't do it anymore. I don't overhead press anymore because of whatever. And they're taking away these exercises that are so effective and not realizing that like you can do those forever. Uh, you just need to focus on mobility, connection, stability. If you do that, you'll do them until, until you die. Well, this is definitely related, but it just reminds me of uh, when I used to play basketball with my dad and like his friends and like we would just do these pickup games on the weekend and the amount of prep necessary for him just to be able to step out on the court and like move and like actually have movement and not be stiff rigid and have like some immediate pain was like vital he had to do this whole ritual this process you know rub the asper cream the ben gay on all, every <laughs> single joint uh and i make fun of him and i was like what why do you have to do all of this like i just get up and go and i'm ready to go and uh, and, and you just realize that uh, all of this uh, additional time that you've spent doing uh, in creating patterns, creating movement patterns, uh, you know, the environment you're presenting yourself all the time, like all of that, you have, you're fighting against that now, like the, the further you age, like all of that becomes like part of your, like, 
the solidified programming that now it's it's vital that we have to interrupt that and we have to like create better movement patterns and start recreating that education with your body to be able to respond properly. So glad that we're having this discussion today because it's, you know, it feels like, I feel like when, especially with family and friends, that this is like, we communicate this, I feel like all the time, yet they still seem to ignore this or be like, oh yeah, I'll get around or it's not that important. On the way to work today, my mother's husband called me to tell me, hey, I've been following the series on YouTube. Now, granted, this is my mother's husband of many years now, and I've talked to him. He has every access to every one of our programs. I've told him what to do a million times. Uh, I know he's been in the gym for a while now. And uh, he's like, yeah, man, so I started following your series and been doing all the mobility stuff before he goes, holy crap, that makes a huge difference. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. wow, really? But I wish I, wish you, I, wish I would have told you Yeah, that. I know. It's like, it's so crazy to me because I feel like I know I've definitely communicated that like thoroughly to him, but it's like, he needed to see me do it. Mm -hmm. He needed something so basic just to follow, like I'll just do the same things he's doing. And then right away sees the translation in his movement and his workout, like, holy crap, that makes a huge difference. And it's more, it's more than, <laughs> yeah, by the way, I want to really be, I want to be clear. It's more than just a proper warm up. So people think mobility, oh, I have to have a good warm up. And the reason why I have to good, have to a good warm up is because I'm older now. Right. So my body's more stiff and I don't recover as fast and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. No, 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 no that's not, that's not, that's true, but that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is, when you're over 40, you've had a longer time uh, on the in the world to move in ways that are not optimal. And even if it's slightly off optimal, if you do that for 20 years, then things start to become a problem. So if you think of a machine hinge, if it's if it moves one degree outside of optimal, you're not going to notice at first. But then over time, the joint starts to wear the the hinge. You start to see problems. And so this is what happens uh, once you get to 40 plus is that, yeah, you know, I ran and I worked out and my technique was just a little off on my exercise, but it never bothered me. But I've been doing it for so long now. I have to stop. I have to stop doing those exercises. Mobility work fixes that, maintains good technique, good control, maintains good connection, and you get better results. And the reason why, Adam, you, you know this, why people ignore that advice is they don't realize that mobility Helps with fat loss and muscle gain. Yeah. They think, oh, mobility is if I hurt, yeah. but I want to do all this other stuff that builds muscle and body fat. 100%. They think it's like a waste of time or it's not going to contribute to their main goal. It, it, mm -hmm. It's the most important thing that contributes yeah. to your main goal. It makes all the workouts, all the exercises yeah. that are effective more effective. And of course, of course, it prevents the massive roadblock of potential injury and pain. So when you're over 40, the emphasis has to be on proper mobility priming dynamic warm-ups full range of motion exercise slow uh, f uh you know uh tempo and technique and con connection over the amount of weight you 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 move for example so mobility really is just an umbrella term that encompasses an emphasis on movement that's it so when i am doing an exercise that i can do if my if i'm over 40 and i'm like okay mobility is super important well here i can add 10 pounds to the bar or I can go down a little deeper and get better connection, or I can hold the weight at the top and stabilize my core, or I can slow down the tempo a little bit and make the technique that much more perfect. That's what we mean by mobility. It's this, it's this emphasis on movement. And if you emphasize movement, you're going to get way better results, fat loss, yeah. muscle, ba muscle gain uh, across the board. I guess you could also talk about the benefit of aging in terms of like really understanding your body and, and yeah. realizing which exercises move you move the needle the most and, and which to kind of prioritize, which ones might be a little more high risk, which ones might be a little less risk, but like give you more benefit to it. And so this is, this is something too, like as we age, I know this has to play a factor in yeah. terms of like figuring out like that minimal viable dose and like kind of what Adam always describes with uh, that sort of mentality going into it. Like, what can I do uh, in, in terms of the least amount to give me the most? hundred percent. I would. Okay. I've been a consistent lifter in my twenties. I've now been a consistent lifter in my forties. I wouldn't trade 
any of the the youth or whatever for my 20s for who I am in my 40s when it comes to lifting. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like even though I know that I could take more and and I had yeah. more resiliency and more energy. You get better results now cuz you know more. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Like I like I'm way way in a better position today than I than I was back there for that exact reason. Like you just that there's a huge benefit and I and I'm glad you said it cuz I feel like sometimes we we make this like aging thing such a disadvantage. It's like oh you're getting older and you yeah. this is yeah. where you start losing muscle like and depressing. testosterone goes yeah. down and it's like this all this bad thing. It's like no if you've been putting the work in and and learning all this and and applying a lot of this stuff, boy, it just gets way better as you get older. I I, I mean we we train clients for a long time and the majority of people that hire trainers tend to be in this age group or older partially because they have the expendable income to hire mm -hmm. a trainer and I mean. The majority of my clients in their mid forties, late forties, who worked with me consistently, would make this comment: "This is the best shape I've ever been in my entire life." Yeah. Even when they were For athletes sure. in their youth or whatever, they actually got in the best shape in this at this time because everything was applied appropriately. So, so what's the point with this? Less is more. Now, I'm going to oversimplify the muscle building, fat loss, body adapting process. I'm going to oversimplify it, but I think this illustrates what we're trying to explain. So, imagine. The signal to, to let's use the, the signal for building muscle. Imagine it as a light switch. It's either on or off. That's it. And I can flick it on or I can hammer it on. And if I hammer it on, I break the switch. Now my body has to fix the switch before it actually gets the signal. When you turn on a light, you, you flick it on. That's it. It's on. The light is on. When you send the signal to build muscle, you're done. That's it. You're done. You've done what you need to do. Now the body's going to build. Anything above and beyond that just compromises your body's ability to adapt. You actually get worse results, in other words. So you're doing more work, not just not getting more results, you're actually getting less results. So you have to be really smart, and most people do way more than is necessary, thus getting less results and, of course, wasting time. So what does that look like for the average 40-something-year-old when it comes to strength training? Two days a week. When you become advanced, three days a week. That's it. Like 90 something percent of people in their 40s who want to be fit and healthy, who have a normal life, three days a week of strength training is about as far as you're ever going to need to right or, dose. or want to go. And that'll get you the best possible results. And I know there's those extreme cases of that 40 something year old is a bodybuilder who trains five, six days a week. Uh, that's an extreme case. And if you try to emulate what they do, not only are you not going to get the results that they get, you'll get worse results than if you just train twice a week with much more intelligence. So less is more. Yeah, I, I think that gets even, it, that's a, even uh, more of a point too with any sort of experience, right? I think two to three days a week takes a person from ground zero of never lifting before and and 40 plus years old. It That, that takes them plenty far. If you actually have, so, if you've even invested in building muscle in previously, uh, man, it does not take, and I'm, con I'm like, uh, I'm being reminded of that as this, this whole thing I'm like unfolds. It's kind of interesting today. Um, you know, son of a bitch, I overreached again. And like, I, you guys saw me before we started I'm like foam rolling. Cause my IT is fucked up. I'm like a mess right now. And, and I'm like scratching my head. Cause I'm like, God, I really didn't I mean, I'm pressing the weight right now, but I haven't really increased the volume. I went from the two exercises a day to like kind of an upper lower split. And then even then I'm only doing still like two, three exercises for my legs in one workout. It's not crazy, but it's like, oh my God, I still mm -hmm. over overreached. I still would have been better off kind of keeping it slow with the two day a week. And it's like, it's, it's interesting to me uh, that I'm still learning this lesson, uh, now, like, it's like, wow, it's, it's unbelievable. And I don't know why, like, I'm uh, in this hurry to do more because the progress, obviously the progression I've been seeing is incredible, but yeah, even I struggle with mm -hmm. that, right? Oh, I, I want more. You know, I'm, I'm 18 pounds of muscle in one month. Is it enough? Let's see if I can stretch out a little more. It's like, what am I thinking? Like, you know, cause this applies even, uh, even to us. And the more I've, the more you've lifted in the past, uh, yeah. the, like a, the is that less you even have to put towards. In other words, it's true for everyone. Yes. Uh, the 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 last one uh, is to prioritize sleep. Now, let me just explain how how impactful this is. If you took the typical out of shape, deconditioned, you know, seventy percent, eighty percent processed food diet, forty six year old, and all you did was fix their sleep, all you did was give them optimal sleep, where they're sleeping eight hours, deep sleep, good 
stages of sleep, the whole deal, right? If you just did that, here's what you would see. Fat loss, strength gain, and better behaviors, less cravings, better mood, just from sleep. That's how powerful this is. Uh, and, and now people don't tend to focus on sleep until it's so bad that it, it, it messes everything up. So typically when someone says, Hey, I need to work on my sleep. It's because they're getting horrible <laughs> <No> sleep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. sleep. Yeah. But what people don't realize is if you get by with okay sleep, so like you're okay, you just need caffeine and yeah, I'm a little groggy, but whatever you take that person and you optimize their sleep profound benefits. Now, of course, if you're so sleep deprived that you just feel like you're a zombie, yeah, you're already prioritizing this. But to most people listening right now, if you're like, yeah, I'm okay, you know, I need coffee in the morning and yeah, I wake up a couple times, whatever, not a big deal. Oh, no, no. Optimize your sleep. Watch what happens to your gains. And there's, by the way, there's lots of studies on this. One of my favorites, they took groups of people, controlled their calories and everything, put them on a calorie restricted diet. Everything was the same. One group got great sleep. The other group got not so great sleep. The not so great sleep group lost half the body fat and also lost more muscle. In other words, everything was the same except the sleep, mm. and yet they got half the results. This is a big deal, and I can't tell you how many times with clients, we would just <coughs> fix this one thing right here, and all the other pieces would fall into place. You have to explain, too, though, Sal, like how this actually gets exacerbated, too, based off of other factors, too, meaning like it's our, it's getting bad sleep is already a game killer already, right? And the yeah. study points that out. But then you add in the other things that people do in common, miss protein intake, way under eat their calories, way over train on volume and intensity. So that sleep already matters in the context of a good diet, uh, good programming, yeah. balanced intensity volume, hitting protein intake. But that that gets exacerbated when you also don't do those things, which is the common person. So, so I was trying to communicate that in my series about having a bad night's sleep. And I'm like, listen, if I had one night of bad sleep and I was scheduled to come work out, uh, not that big of a deal so long as I hit my protein intake, I balance my intensity in that workout a little bit and the volume of it. But when you, and then I'm also eating in a caloric surplus, so I have plenty of calories, but flip that, take that same scenario. Oh, I missed my protein intake. I'm low, ca I'm low calorie and I'm going to get after my workout. Now that becomes a whole different situation. So it's like sleep alone makes this big of a difference. But what people don't really realize too is like, oh, like kind of a bad night of sleep with low protein, with calorie deficit, with over applying intensity workout now becomes a disaster. And this is what I think a lot of people don't realize. Yeah, imagine doing. this picture, right? Like you, you're, you're doing a few things that aren't so great for your health and fitness. So that's a fire. Now, poor sleep. You just, you got yeah. bad sleep. You just literally poured a bunch of gasoline on it. That's what it does. It makes things yeah, that aren't trying great. to put it out. Yeah, you're <laughs> exaggerating it, 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 oh, exaggerating it be above and beyond what it would have normally been. In other words, if it's at a five, and then you add poor sleep to it, it now became a 20. Mm -hmm. Like not like a six, like it became a 20 because it all it affects your tolerance so much. And it also affects your behavior. It's like simply getting good sleep leads to better eating behaviors. It leads to more consistency with your workouts. It leads to better technique. In fact, the greatest factor, the, the one factor that is going to predict injury in a workout more than anything else is poor sleep. They did yeah. studies on this where it's like, they, they, they did warm up, no warm up, priming, no priming, exercise, good form, bad form. The one thing that predicted injury more than any, anything else actually doubled the risk of injury yeah. was poor sleep. So it's that big of a deal. Dysfunction comes in. And again, it doesn't sound sexy unless you're like so bad asleep that you feel like a zombie. If you're just like, whatever, I just want to burn body fat, build muscle. Like this is why the fitness space doesn't talk about it. This is why the industry doesn't talk about it because it's not sexy. But I'm mm -hmm. telling you right now, when it comes to muscle gain and fat loss, Almost nothing will impact your ability to do those things like your sleep. And just going from okay to great sleep makes a huge difference. Well, that's such a huge point because I think most people are in that category. And it's like it's they're not going to address it if it's not this alarming uh, sense that like I'm not getting any sleep. And, and it's pretty obvious that like I'm kind of walking throughout the day like a zombie and um, you know, it's something I, I need to address this. But like if you have that sort of okay sleep where we're – Maybe let's say you're you're missing like an hour and this just over time, like it just keeps adding up, it keeps adding up. 
Um, so to the point where now, you know, it's, it's, you're tolerating it and, mm. and you're just kind of moving your way through. But if you adjust and you all of a sudden now you gain that extra hour of sleep, what that does to, you know, reset your hormones to, to get oh, your energy everything. to, yeah, everything, uh, it, it, it maximizes all your efforts. Totally. Totally. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, I have a free guide that teaches you how to lose fat in three steps, just three steps that will burn the most amount of body fat and help keep it off. This guide is totally free. We're giving it to everybody right now. If you want it, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. All right, so I'm going to change directions here. Did you guys see the new data on birth order? Firstborn versus lastborn versus- There's oh, data in regards yeah, new, to what? There's new data. So Adam, you'll like this. <laughs> Justin and Doug won't like this too much. <laughs> so pretty consistent- so I'll have a counter argument. Yeah, pretty, <laughs> pretty consistently. Now, of course, it's not true for everybody. But this is just trends, is data. <laughs> just, just a Objective majority. numbers. Just, just a majority. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice Sports setup. Know everything. Nice setup in their own mind. I think they know that yeah. they're not going to like this. Right. Uh, the firstborns consistently have a higher IQ than the second, third, and definitely the, the Written last. Written and reported I can, by firstborn. I, I, yeah. can, <laughs> <laughs> I can confirm this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, there's some theories around this, by the way. Yeah, yeah. What's the thought? What is the theory of why that is? Like, what, how does order have anything to do with that? And is that some? So is 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 IQ something that yeah, is uh, that is in socially influenced? It obviously yes. is. If that's mm -hmm. the case, they're trying mm -hmm. to make right. It's yeah. not like something you're born with that IQ. You are. There's both. There's okay. genetic, okay, and then there's that. So hear. there's two are two theories as to why. One <clears throat> is the na so nature versus nurture, right? So one is the nurture argument, which is. Well, mom had much more undivided attention and could focus on this one child and they could, you know, communicate to them. They, don't, they weren't so busy. Like if you have three kids, the third one, you're busy, right? So yeah. you can't spend as much time on them. Um, so uh, there's that. Then, yeah. there's, then there's also the nature argument, which is that the, it's, and you see this more pronounced when there's, when there's small age gaps. So when it's like mom has one kid, a year later has another one, a year later has another one. Yeah. It's like it's it, it, her body becomes um, her, her the nutrients that she delivers to the baby uh, become hampered because it's such a, a demanding process. Oh, interesting! It doesn't give her a full time to like fully Correct. recover and come back. Because when you see a larger gap, then mm -hmm. you start to see less of that. So it's it's both. They believe that are playing a role in that uh, the the. the, the Undivided attention, and then you know. Oh, I should apologize to my sister. Not getting, but <laughs> you took all. The, I'm sorry, sis. You yeah, took yeah, all yeah. the nutrients. You took all of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's so like the uh, hey. Dan Danny DeVito, Arnold Schwarzenegger theory. Yeah, uh, right. that like yeah. he got the good genes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he took all the. What good a genes. great movie that was. Yeah, it was classic. Yeah. So you know what's funny about this is it went viral because it was like oldest, you know, firstborn, lastborn, whatever. It went viral. I know exactly why. Because every firstborn. Shit yeah, they sending right. that to their yeah, siblings. Yeah. Of course they did. Hey, See it. I told you it's smarter. Yeah. Yeah. Said, it's, it's, my, you know, it's, it's the facts. I don't know what to say. About. I want to see like, uh, like statistics on who's more successful, though. You know? I think it's firstborn. It is. is it? Yeah. Yeah. That's not yeah. going your last way. That's not going your way. That's not going your way either. <laughs> last, last one more likely Damn to be it. in jail. It was another one that was in there. Oh, yeah, okay. Be in trouble. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You guys, so Justin, pretty, you guys are doing well. We're, we're more violent. You guys are sweeter. No, you guys are nicer, yeah. sweeter, uh, more sensitive. You guys definitely bucked their I think uh, there's, if we look at creativity, there may be some interesting things. I do about think, that. I think I actually, yeah, do right think brain, that, left brain, I think it's, I do think there is stuff around you have to come up because with, when you're being ignored, you yeah. have to figure <laughs> things out. You gotta, you gotta get creative. You gotta make your own friends. <laughs> yeah. Imaginary, maybe. You have to be creative to think of solutions to things that you just can't figure out. It's too hard. Just kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, did just, you send it to you all your smart siblings? Than no. You didn't send it to your siblings? No, man. It's uh, like, why would I do that? Uh, uh, I don't know. I would send it to mine. I would totally They do wouldn't that. understand it anyway. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> And so you said it to him. I'm not sure you guys will understand hey, this or not. Let me break it down for you because I know you won't understand the study. No, that's it. But no, it was it was going viral, and I'm like, and by the way, there's okay, just so you guys. I'm obviously poking at you. Yeah. There's studies that show this doesn't exist or whatever, but this was one that shows it exists, and uh, and it went viral. And I'm looking at it, I'm like, I know why this is going viral. Now every firstborn is sending this of to course, their siblings. Of course, of course. Uh -huh. Now, were you? What's you know? your? Remind me what your really age gap is with your brother. Out. What's your age gap with your brother? So it's so I it's all it, it goes boy girl boy girl. Yeah, I know. I know. Your sister's next. Me, it's four years between me and my sister and then it's two two 
So, oh, so goes, your brother's six years younger than yeah. you. Okay, so he's probably so. Yeah. What I was asking is, I was going to ask if there was any competitiveness with him, but with six years, he probably wasn't. Oh, ever, there still is a little bit more. Yeah. I actually probably more as an adult than there was when you were a kid. Yeah, is that right. Yeah, but I, hey, well, I'll one hundred percent say this: he got the physical genetics for sure. Yeah. He's much bigger, much stronger, much faster naturally. Than I ever, you know, than I ever would be. He knows yeah. this. Yeah. Just, Do you remember at what age, uh, at what age you started to see a competitive side with him? Like, it, like he started to feel like he was competitive with you. Do you remember? Oh, How far God. back does it go? It makes sense. At six years, if I had to guess, it probably wouldn't have happened until almost 20, yeah. 20, 20 something years yeah. old. Because now at twenty, he sees himself as an adult. You've yeah. already been an adult for a while, and now it becomes more of a like a. You know, the tr truth be told, we have we have a fun competitive side where we, we we mess with each other. But he's such a his nickname is Joker because he's always smiling, always laughing, always having a good time, always fun. Uh, so unless I poke at him on purpose, then he can get a little mad and then it gets a little heated between us. But, and that's, I think just older brother, I was probably an asshole, you know, when we were growing up cause I was the oldest of these little kids Yeah, and I was given way too much authority, mom, way too much authority. Yeah. You know, you don't, you don't give a 10 year old the authority to ground their siblings cause you don't know how to handle that very well. You know, it's crazy you say that cause when you bring that up, it reminds me of, um, so my mom and, and they haven't ever recovered from that. So my, my uncle uh, which is her older brother. Oh. Um, my grandmother worked uh, two shifts, seven days a week. Like he pretty much raised my mom yeah. and they hate each other. That's a bad situation. Yeah. And like this, so I know like you guys worked it out, like you figured it out, like your siblings and you have a yeah, good you relationship. Put a, you put, a, that, that you put is, a 12 year old in charge of other kids and you give them the authority to ground them uh, in some cases, you know, even corporal punishment uh, with some families. Like a twelve year old is not to handle that, so you end up becoming a tyrant. Or yeah, and it, and it's wild because it's when I hear my mom communicate, it's like she cannot, she can't get past it. Still, yeah. I mean, to this day, she's sixty something years old, and she Trauma. still sees exactly. She yeah. still sees him as this oppressive older brother yeah. who hated her and punished her for all these reasons, and he got to do whatever he wanted and was this bad kid, and it's yeah. like. Really, and obviously my grandmother's mistake, right, my, of like empowering him to be that way. And then it's unfortunate because even today they haven't been able to mend that from, from childhood. Back in the day, that's how it was though, huh? You have nine kids. Super common. How, are you, like you have to have. Well, yeah, delegate. Or, yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and in my grandmother's defense, I mean, what do you do? She's working yeah. two shifts a day, seven yeah, days a week, a single woman raising raising two kids by herself. What was she supposed to do? Right. It was the, it was like the only option. And so it's, it's unfortunate though, because how, how detrimental Doug what's the distance uh, years between you and your brother six years okay so are you uh, second yeah. or third no I'm fourth oh you are the youngest I'm the dumbest of them all yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey they must be brilliant because you're pretty smart uh, yeah, they must be absolutely uh, brilliant no, but no so my oldest sister's 12 years older than me and then I have a 10 year older sister than my brother. Oh, wait a so minute. So you're the youngest but six years apart from the second the youngest mm -hmm. or whatever yes so you're an accident uh, yeah, you might say that. <laughs> so I yeah, actually, I I actually assume that you and your brother were closer in age because you, I know there's a little bit of that competitiveness that you have with them. Uh, probably me being more competitive with him than him with me. Oh, I bet. I bet yeah. he didn't even yeah, see he, you. He probably, I mean, probably thought, oblivious. Oh, yeah. if, he's 16, you're, if you're 16, you're not looking at your 10-year-old brother right. being like, no. yeah, I'm going to punk you. He's not thinking like that. You might be going like, I want to try to catch like, up to him. just like, don't touch my stuff. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. Put my records down. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All that stuff. <laughs> oh, that's oh, interesting. Wow. And then you're, how many years apart from two. your brother? And is it just you two? It's just us two, yeah. Oh, yeah. But it was very was, competitive. You guys were very so close in age. Yeah. yeah, probably the whole time. Yeah, and like you said, like I had the physical, like, and that, that kind of shifted. I think it was when I was like 10 or so, and all of a sudden, like I got stronger than him. And then it was like, you don't fucking get to tell me what to do. It and was, then that was it. The, wow. the, the power, the power, the power, the power shifted like real fast. Yeah. <laughs> I had a cousin like that, dude. He was older than me and he would punk me when I was little. And then I started going through, you know, puberty and getting bigger yeah, yeah. and working out. And I remember there was like one time when he tried to punk me and yeah. I was like, Oh, this is the last time you're going to do that. And mm -hmm. I, I fought back. That's funny. And, oh, that was it. After have, that, have, he ignored I have, me. I have a, I have a same what story. a wonderful feeling that was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because when you're a kid and someone's bullying you, you're like, you dream that about That was my that. cousin uh -huh. too. I had a cousin yeah. that all through like junior high, even early years of high school was always fucking with me and stuff like that. And then like back half of high school and then definitely afterwards was way, way bigger than that. Fix that real quick. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, so older older kids, be cool with the younger ones. Yeah. Like, yeah. Kick your ass. It was all right though. It was like, we had that kind of moment and there was a lot of like 
like physical fight stuff. We got through that and then we became friends. And then I was like, it was, I was in a weird position because it was like high school. I was always looking out for him because like he was getting punked because mm. he was on the dorky side of the, the, the fence and looked a lot like Screech, you know, from Say by the Bell. And like people used to punk him for that. And I'm like, shut the fuck up, you know, yeah. like. And so I was always sort of like looking out for him and then getting in fights with guys way older than me uh, and getting my ass kicked. But it was like, I don't know. It was, it was, it was a weird, it was a different dynamic than I think most people would, would think. My, my best friend who you guys know of, his, his little brother was that. So they, he was two years younger than him. Mm. And it was so funny because my, my buddy, and my, we didn't get in a lot of fights, but he was, my best friend was just kind of chill, passive, not like looking to do stuff like that. You know, easily somebody can talk shit to him and he would just be like, oh, it's okay. No big deal. But his little brother, two years younger, was just a spitfire, always mm. in trouble, always getting in fights. And so he would bring him along to parties and stuff like that. And he always, if somebody like talked shit, even just stared at my buddy, you know, the wrong way, his little brother. <laughs> like hypervigilant. Yes, thing. his little brother would come running over and just punch a guy out of oh, nowhere yeah. and then brawling. I went through a phase of that, yeah. Yeah, it got to a point where I actually had to tell him, bro, you can't bring your brother with our, go to our <laughs> parties, dude. We can't because I don't know what he's going to do. I don't know. Him and his friends are going to fight our you'd friends. Have to, you'd have to connect yeah. him with a girl get him out of the way. Yes, yeah, that was the, that's always that's the, like the, the high diffuser. school yeah. formula, right? Yeah, get, him, get, him, get him hooked up. Yeah. And he'll be all right. My so. brother was just, he, he's just like, a, he's a kind of this happy-go-lucky kid, but as he started to get older, when I started managing gyms, so I'm, let's see, 18, so he's 12, 12 or 13, right? So he's a kid. He'd come in to work out, and I would call. I'll never forget. What was his name? I had this trainer that worked for me, this jacked, like, bodybuilder trainer. Can't remember his name right now. Black dude. I can't remember his name. And a uh, big guy. And I remember my brother comes in to work out. He's a skinny 13-year-old kid, you know? And he's like, oh, is that your brother? Because we look alike. I'm like, yeah. yeah, yeah. And he goes and works out. And I'm like, I bet you my brother can beat you in arm wrestling. He started laughing because he's a skinny 13-year-old. So I called him over. I paged my brother. My brother beat him in arm wrestling for the whole staff. Oh, it was God. so, yeah. Little, there was a period of time, time. What, how old were you guys? Because there was a period of time when uh, when I first met you or seen you like at the company and then I'd see your brother and I thought you guys were the same person. So there was a period of time where you guys looked a lot alike. There's something like. about us that people can tell. I get stopped oh, all the yeah, time. Oh, yeah. Profile. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah you guys look. Stop. I, I don't. Before Adam throws <laughs> in the beat. <laughs> <laughs> the beat comes. We both there in having faces. <laughs> I mean, I don't feel like. I'm so like, self-conscious. And I don't know. <laughs> we just made that up. I didn't even have that. Uh, I didn't even have like, that insecurity until I know. guys did. I think Justin made it up first. I did. I think Justin said it first. I'm good at that. I just doubled down on it. to make people But I mean, I guess maybe because we were friends i know you so well now i don't see it at all yeah but i remember when i first met you in the company and then i would see him i'd be like wait a second he's what's he doing over here and i totally thought that you guys were the same so you guys definitely look enough that if you don't know you yeah. really well that you yeah him that. and my sister inherited my dad's genes because my sister obviously being a girl i would have her arm wrestle my friends in high school and she beat them she, wow. she's, and she's still like that she's still she doesn't work out or anything but if, if you if she were here i'd have her Arm wrestler, just so you can feel the power that girl has. It's oh, pretty, yeah. Uh, that's, oh, and it skipped me though. I didn't get those. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, that's good stuff. Honestly, though, that so I mean, I, I mean, I always think about stuff like that too. Though, probably, uh, you know, to the advantage, right? It probably made you obsessive, work extra hard, like because you didn't have that advantage. You had to work extra hard. I mean, at least that's how I feel about myself. The things that others would call disadvantage yeah. or unfortunate yeah. or Super whatever. Superpowers. Yeah, I think that I think that's the thing. I mean, we had this big talk. My my uh, Hampton group. Everybody is on different uh, aisle or on different sides of the aisle politically and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it's a really and they're all very intelligent. So really good. Nice discussions. Very very this, good discussions. Good and everyone's yeah. become really close friends. And so we can actually have some really good mm -hmm. disagreements on on stuff like that. And. You know, there's a couple of us that have a a, a pretty challenging upbringing, and so it was interesting to hear uh, the 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 thoughts around privilege and all this. And I'm like, you know, it's really interesting how society we use this whole thing around uh, we 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 make everything about reaching a dollar amount, like that's the ultimate. Like the, the advantage in life is to be privileged for mm -hmm. connections, so you can make more money and be more wealthy and more. And it's like, you know, who decided that? Like who decided that like that's the ultimate goal no, and the right. ultimate privilege is to have the most access to money? Like, I don't know if I agree with that. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think uh, developing one's character 
is probably one of the most privileged things. Like having a good character is probably one of the most greatest advantages that you could ever have. And then I would make the case and argument that, well, where does your character get the most built? Is it in situations that everything's laid up for you and you get every door opens and daddy connects you and you start at the, the be middle of the race instead of the beginning? Yeah. I would make the case that um, I had to build way more character by having all these obstacles and disadvantages and looking back now and realizing that money isn't everything. And if it is about developing one's character that, oh man, I think maybe I was set up for the advantage, but oh boy, that's a real, I had a, a real interesting conversation to get into. You know, it reminds me of, I used to have, uh, back in the day when I used to train a lot of doctors and surgeons, one of them was a woman. Um, and let's see, at the time, I think she was in her early sixties. So this was maybe 15, 18 years ago or so. And I would train other surgeons that would talk about her and they would all talk about her like she was. And she was, she was well known as being one of the best surgeons, not just in the area, but anywhere in the U S. And I remember one of them explaining to me and said, you know, Sal, the, the fact that she's a woman, she came up when she did at those times, there was lots of, I mean, female surgeon was hard to find and, oh, you're coming up in this male dominated space. He's like, the fact that she came up and did it alone already self-selects her to be a freaking badass right, because right, right. she had to be that much better right. uh, just to make it through. And, it, and so, and she would say that, that it was an advantage that yeah. she came into this and she felt the, she felt the, you know, people looking at her like, Oh, can you do this? And it made her, she was incredible as a, as a result. So I, I agree with you. I think those disadvantages, I think your mindset, if you have the right mindset, you're in, you're in for some training. That's going to make you, it's going to give you advantage. Especially if, if your measurement in life uh, around success isn't solely tied to a dollar amount. Because you can make the case all day long, like if a, a billionaire son is going to have so many other doors up and, he, and the likelihood that he could become a centimillionaire right. or billionaire is much higher, right? right? Because he gets to start way over here and the yeah. connections you make, like, okay, that's a total, I don't disagree with that. Sure. But then- does that did he win at life because yeah, he made yeah. a billion and maybe I only made a million? You know, like is he did he win more at life because of the, the the dollar amount? I don't know. I don't I don't necessarily think that's the. I mean, I don't define success that way. Mm -hmm. And so, if you don't define success that way, well, then how do you define it? Well, I would think it would be developing well, myself into this incredible character that then can pass those traits down to my son, who can become an even better character than I was. I would say that's probably the uh, winning or success in, in life. Well, that's right? the data's clear on that. Yeah. Uh, Arthur Brooks explains that, um, that because it's a kind of a consumer based uh, society, we have placed, we, you know, access to stuff we've placed at the top. Yeah. That's the ultimate value. Right. And the data is clear. That is not what brings you happiness. There's a, there's a minimum, right? You got to have your basic needs met and all that stuff. Once you surpass that, there's other things that are like, if you don't have food, shelter, transportation, like, okay, that's a problem. Once you get beyond that, uh, th like it's not going to bring you that much more value. Not, you think it will? I would even, but I, it, but it doesn't. I would even make the case there's a bit of like misery that comes with it. So the weekend before, I was with all my car buddies, right? And one of the guys had a, his his dad died and passed him down, you know, five hundred million dollars. Wow. Okay. Like and an income still, like so, just an infinite an infinite amount of money. Yeah. And this dude has every car you could think of, every new crazy hyper car that comes out that's millions of dollars. He's got them on order. At all times, he's got five cars coming. And just like, doesn't even look like he really cares or enjoys it. It's like he's constantly, he needs that, uh, mm -hmm. the new, and I think to myself like, wow, like I have such an appreciation of of my little cars because of how hard I work to get to that. Like it's, and I, it, it's like a different, you know like, what that reminds me of? I feel like he's been robbed of that, that uh, something oh, that yeah. I get to have. And it's like, and, he has way more than me. Bro, though. imagine playing a video game and you don't go through all the levels or whatever. You go, to the end, you go to the end credits, you won. Yeah. You just turn it on. You won end credits. This sucks. Yeah. This game sucks. I don't yeah. care. Like it doesn't, that, doesn't that's, what I'm, that's my point is yeah, that like half of also is the struggle of the, yeah. I can't and I'm reaching and I'm driving towards something. And then it, and it took a long time to get there. And then I finally get a, a taste, a little bit of it. And it's like, Whoa, do I appreciate yeah. it? And Whoa, do am I so like happy and grateful for it versus the kid who has way ahead and got the windfall. And it's just like, I actually feel bad for him yet. He has way more than me, but I feel bad for him because he doesn't have the same appreciation and love for the things yeah. that he has. And so it's that's a, why they show yeah. children from wealthy it's parents empty. that do well. It's because their parents have them go out and volunteer a lot. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that they do. Uh, they have to go out and volunteer and do to work. truly appreciate yes. where they're and at. And then they do better. The Makes kids sense. that just get their stuff given to them, 
there's a there's a word for it. It's called spoiled. We yeah. know what that means, yeah. <laughs> and it does. It spoils a, a, a person. It spoils a character. Yeah, it's crazy too because I feel bad for the. Um, you know, I, what happens to a lot of parents, and I know that if I would have been an early, a young dad, this would have happened to me. Because in my 20s, there's a part of you, when you come from that, that you're Oh, still, you would have put your insecurities on I would have put my insecurities right back on my kid. Yeah. Um, thinking, and also, it, it, wrapping it in the, I'm doing what's best for him, yeah. right? I mean, how many times have you heard that? Like, I worked so hard, so my kids didn't have to go through what I had, or what like that. And so then you... So they have the best clothes. The right, best so they have the, the best clothes, yeah. the best everything. And so then you overcompensate that way. Thinking... You're doing all this out of love and because you want to help them. You don't want them to go. But what you don't realize, you're robbing them. Yeah. You're actually robbing them and making it, you're setting them up for a worse situation. But you're doing it out of a place coming from love. But what you, but real, real you think it's coming from love. It's really coming from insecurity. Yeah, fear. Yeah. All right. Fear. fear of what you didn't have. And so, I don't know. It's just a, yeah. I love, con we, I, we had a really yeah. deep conversation around all that stuff. And it's really interesting because you, there's such a, a very diverse group of, not only on political aisles, but some of us came from nothing. Some of us came from very wealthy families. And so pretty interesting to it's hear. It's interesting too. Yeah. Cause I mean, even like that concept of spoiling your kids, like anybody can spoil their kids, you know, anybody can provide yeah. them with that mentality and, and pass it on, you know, regardless of their economic status. That's right. And so it's like, you know, like just addressing that for what it is. And like, this is why I have like my own qualms about like things like, um, you know, like the trophy, everybody gets a trophy. Like everybody gets this, like everybody just gets provided these, like we're spoiling kids. We're, we're, we're robbing them of, of that, that drive, that purpose, struggle. That, that, that struggle, that, that builds that character. It, it leads towards, you know, enriching, uh, them to pursue that purpose and to have that kind of meaningful life. What a good point, Justin, because I know there's some people that are tuned out because they're like, oh, I'm not rich, so I can't, I'm not spoiling my kid, but you absolutely still can. I remember it, uh, Katrina and I always remind ourselves, uh, and I know Jordan Peterson is is famous for saying it. Like the worst thing that you could ever do to your kids is to do something for them they can do themselves. That they can do mm -hmm. for themselves, yeah. And so, and that's and it's really easy to get caught up in that. I mean, we're definitely guilty of especially because sometimes you might have good intentions, but it's just faster to do it yourself. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. Like Katrina and I, this is a regular conversation that we always remind ourselves. Like, gosh dang it, you know what? There's one of those situations where, you know, what am I doing doing that? Like, he can do that. Like, let him do it. Be patient. Who cares if it takes a little longer or he messes up? Like, we got to stop doing that. So, you got real easily, you, that can get away from you if you don't continually remind yourself. And it's not just monetary because that's easy, right? It's real easy. Oh, just don't spend all the money or you don't have money to spend on them. So, you, then you can automatically go, oh, I'm not spoiling my kid. Well, you still can. You absolutely still can. If you're doing the little things for them still that they could potentially do themselves, you're robbing them That's of that a, for sure. And 100%. Hey, sorry to interrupt. We have a free guide titled Understanding Your Mood, Stress, and Sleep. It tackles all of those things from a health and longevity perspective. It's a totally, totally free guide. So just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, so um, I want to talk about one of our partners, Organifi. They have um, this starter pack where they're, where you can go, you get the red and green juice together. I used to call this, you guys remember what I called this back in the day? Christmas blend. The Christmas oh, blend. Oh, I was going to say yeah, Kermit, but yeah. yeah, yeah the no, blend. that's yeah, what you called me because you yeah. said I sound like Kermit. Uh, yeah, what are you talking about? Thanks. So red juice, good for energy. Green juice, great for gut health and kind of that parasympathetic, like relax the body. Great to get to either take together or red juice in the morning, green juice at night. I used to do that. I saw the starter pack i'm gonna do that again they also so great red in the morning green at night it's just a great balance starter pack is cool too because it also includes magnesium which we've talked about yeah. you know it's over 60 percent of the population is deficient in magnesium and if you've never supplemented with magnesium to see if it makes a difference on your you'll sleep, feel that difference it's one of those things you'll feel instantly and then also i think they throw a shaker cup in there too is that right doug it's seven days where you can do green juice and red juice so you could try that alternating thing that i said yeah plus you get 30 days of the magnesium and then you get the the shaker cup what would you first. say uh, the thing that you feel the most in the green juice would you say it is the all the different vitamins that you're getting there or would you say it's something like ashwagandha that you're going to feel the, the the most in there that's i know good. everybody wants that's to a you. good question because i've supplemented separately with ashwagandha i love ashwagandha the green juice it, it might be just the combination of things it, it's a really nice how do i explain this it's a calm it's a it's calm, a calm feeling and not sleepy. I don't get sleepy or anything no, like no, that. No, no, no. It's energy. It's a nice, calm focus. The red juice is a little stimulating. So red juice would be like your pre-workout, although it's not, there's no caffeine, so it's nothing like that. 
but red juice is more like up. Green juice is a little bit more chill. So it's a nice, like nice balance. Yeah, red juice has always been, ever since we got introduced to it, it's been the go-to move for me anytime that I'm trying to come back off of caffeine. You replace I, it with that. I replace it with that because it gives me that feeling of mm -hmm. energy, but it takes out the jittery and the caffeine addiction part mm -hmm. of it. It's, all, it's a perfect segue for somebody that's ever trying to do that. We talk a lot about this on the show, right? We all have like limits that we push ourselves. Caffeine, when we hit that limit, we start to taper back. When I taper back, I just replace those caffeine drinks yep. with the red juice and it's like, yep, works, yep, works yep. perfect. Uh, you know, uh, I was actually, Justin, I thought about you the other day um, on this particular fitness article. So I was reading this fitness article on training an area that nobody exercises or trains unless you play football or you wrestle, the neck. Oh yeah. Nobody trains and strengthens the muscles of the neck. And it, it made me realize like, what a... I, I think it's important to strengthen the entire body. I don't think you need to necessarily train your neck like a football player or wrestler, mm -hmm. but having a strong neck, especially if you work a desk job, mm -hmm. can contribute quite a bit to that that spinal stability, uh, especially up here in the in the cervical area. Sure, prevent neck neck pain, neck upper back pain, upper yeah. back pain, all that stuff. I was in fact the article. You know who they highlighted in the article? Mike Tyson. Oh. Mike, okay, <laughs> so Mike Tyson used to do three hundred. Yeah. Every day, neck bridges, forward and back. 300? He, he was one of the first boxers to specifically... Like tar bro, he had a 19-inch neck. Oh, my God. By the Holy. time he was 19 years old. <laughs> now, boxers figured... I didn't know it was that big. Oh, yeah. Dude, pull up uh, Mike Tyson neck training. There's a picture of his neck, and they, they put a tape measure around yeah, it. Yeah, he's he was a beast. The uh, boxers started to figure out to train their neck because it made it harder to knock them out because mm -hmm. it just stabilized the head. Football players, of course, you guys... For the first ones you wear heavy right. ass helmet. Yeah, and that that was part of it is just wearing the helmet and the constant load there. But but two, I mean, we would do isometric yes. and and partner drills like that too, where we'd push against so like overcoming isometrics and um and I found it very helpful. And it, it yes, it, it I mean it was crucial because of the concussion and the the potential like impingements and things that we would uh, experience with that. But like for your average person, I mean. It's huge, and it, it is totally overlooked. Yeah, there he is right there doing it. Now, he learned – this is a wrestler uh, exercise that he would do. Well, yeah. So, so th this makes for a perfect transition. It's something that I had been meaning to bring up to you guys, and I had forgot about it um, in mind for a little bit different reason. But I've been thinking about just the, the posture in kids, you know, with yeah. iPhones and iPads and the forward head like crazy – and I was like, you know what is probably one of the most underrated movements that I, especially that I'm doing right now. And that I'm like, you know, we just don't talk a lot about. I also remember when I was a trainer, I thought it was stupid. And I look back now, I'm like, again, I was stupid, not the movement uh, for not doing this more often. It's prone cobras. Yeah. Yep. Such a basic, simple movement. Remember when, you know, you always argue with me when I try to put it in a yeah. program. Why do you guys <laughs> yeah. do that? I told, it's great. Every Did time I, I try to put a program, pro cobra in yeah, like, I'm always like pro cobra. You guys make fun of me. Anti everyday stress uh, or everyday posture movement. It it's is excellent. It, it, it's it says so underrated for what everybody should be doing on a regular. And basis. everybody can yeah. do it. Yeah, it's like one of those movements that's it's like valuable. The antidote to yeah, like everyday stress, especially the rotation of the, of the, of the yes. uh, hands and the, yeah, yeah, and pull, great... pulling pulling back and down the scapula like well, so, that. I mean, and, back and to the, the neck head, exercise. The neck, yes, back. I think neck exercise. Here's here's why a lot of people don't do neck. First off. Uh, yeah. I think it's funny when you're a bodybuilder and you have a pencil neck. Sometimes I see that <laughs> and it's silly to me. It, it looks is. weird to yeah. me. Look like a little bobblehead. But besides that, I think people can, some, they don't think about training their neck, but women in particular are afraid of getting this massive neck. Don't worry about it. Just like other body parts, it's not going to happen, but it will strengthen the neck and alleviate oftentimes tension headaches and mm -hmm. neck pain. And no, no, we never train that area. So upper back, we train that, we strengthen that. Neck has to be a part of it because you look at like the forward head. What are, what are these called? Sternoclamastoid muscles, yeah. tight and weak uh, extenders here at yeah. the back of the neck, and so strengthening those really will help with that posture. And talk about like a man. I mean, we, we've talked about this before. Like how many times you guys have had a client who you know needs to lose weight, and 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 then they have poor posture, and then you just put them in good posture. They look they like, look like, they, lost five, they, look like they lost 10, 15 pounds uh, right away just by standing upright. I feel the same is like when you see someone with that awful, like mm -hmm. rounded and way protruding forward head, like that, that person's physique 
looks a million times yeah. better just getting them upright, yeah. like yeah. just teaching them to do that. And I just think that's getting worse and worse with these kids because yeah. they're born now with these iPhones yeah. and it just yeah. they're so it's, forward. It's funny you bring that up though too, because like a lot of articles I've read, and I, I'm really into like kind of the old timey uh, lifters and like what they yeah. used to do, and like so they used to train their masseters a lot as yeah. well, uh, and like a lot of. Um, what they did, they do neck training, but also too, they would jaw. have jaw and and they would bite down on something with like chains and uh, it was part of their. It's act. all connected. I mean, really, the kinetic chain. Like if you go all the way up, like you need to like extend that up through the neck and even into the jaw. You, you know what's funny for maximal output. You want to know what's funny, Justin? So my grandfather, my dad's side, he was known for being strong, right? So it's like this family thing. And they have this old chair that they got rid of finally. But when I was a kid, I went there. They showed me this chair. It had these bite marks on the back. My <laughs> grandfather used to impress his friends oh my God. by lifting this chair with his teeth. That's he would so bite it and he'd lift it with his neck that's and rad. his teeth to that, show how strong that's his, funny. That's funny. Yeah, isn't that funny? That is but, funny. But back in the day, strongmen, that was one of the things they would do is they would hold things in their teeth, bend bars and do all kinds I'm of I'm actually different. surprised like because even with the powerlifting community and all, like I, I'm surprised I don't see that as a component because I guarantee that would like, you know, translate very well back into like your overall maximal output. So there's studies that, so this is going to get weird, uh, but it's true. I've seen studies where um, people will wear a particular type of mouthpiece yeah. that they can bite into and, 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 and grit. And sometimes you see lifters. You do you see that sometimes. It's very rare, but you'll see. And it, it increases their power output. Uh -huh. They can actually lift more weight. I mean, it, it makes sense. You've it's talked about like the studies before where you take somebody yes. who's squeezing something, yeah. right? And they CNS. relax the rest of their body and then you tell them to tense everything up. I mean, it's a, a yep. significant difference on, I mean, that's something everybody who's listening can test right now. Yep. I mean, ball your fists up as hard as you can in your left hand or right hand and relax the whole other side completely and then tense it up and then both you know, give you more yeah power. and then watch yeah. how much more power you get you know, know. huge difference i was gonna so. ask you adam um you stopped the glp1 a few weeks ago yeah have you noticed any changes in your skin because you noticed that when you're on it your psoriasis had come way down is so, any of it coming back so interesting you brought that up um n all the way up until just a week ago i would have said no no difference but um I'm back in. I'm, I'm running a mini bulk right now, and now that I'm in a surplus, oh. I start. I, I I had my first couple of flare. In fact, it's been really yeah. nice. It's yeah. been almost God. How many months now? Three, four months. I was just thinking about this. It's funny you brought this up because I had my first moment of like, oh wow. I went to itch it, and I'm like, I hadn't itched my psoriasis in four months, and I, and I went what? And then I went, oh wow. Well, two things. One, I've had alcohol. In mm. the last like okay. couple weeks, last yeah. two weeks, I've drank alcohol, and in addition to that, I've been in a calorie surplus. And now all of a sudden, I feel it. Now, I luckily, it's not bad. And uh, you know, and when that happens for me now, like I mean, I'm just uh, Caldera is my go-to. Like that's using something natural that I can just rub on there real easy. Like so, it's it that right away tamps it down, and then I'm fine. And then obviously the but the diet is first. Like it's not like have I you mean, tried removing dairy? Because I'm wondering if dairy is mildly inflammatory to you. I and mean, in a surplus, your gut starts to get a little so. That, so that's potential, right? But it doesn't. Dairy doesn't bother me definitely in a deficit or maintenance. So maybe, in, I mean, this is what's so interesting and why I. This think is it, how this is. By the way, this is a good conversation. For people understand when you, we, you, the, it's, things can bother you sometimes, not always, and that's both true. So in a surplus, you could be causing a little gut inflammation, right. a little more spacing, just exaggerate the a little. Gaps. Then you more. get something that eh, mildly annoying or irritating to the body. You can't really tell. Now becomes more. So this is was always my point around the GLP one. Like I never thought that the GLP one had something magical in it. The, I know that they they've, they've attached some stuff that shows that there might be something going on yeah, with autoimmune. autoimmune. Stuff, yeah. I get I get it, but m I always contributed to the low calorie. I'm in such a low calorie because I was a, I could get I could eat some mm. of these things and then just not bother me. And even as I was starting to increase it like to, you know, 2400 and 26 and 2800 calories, still had some of these things get introduced there. I wasn't eating perfectly clean. I was having dairy here and there. I was having some sugar stuff like not crazy or nothing, but then it, then as I started to push beyond 3400 calories, I started to get higher mm. on my calories. Then all of a sudden oh. I, I noticed that. And then I and all, then so and in, in calorie surplus uh, by itself isn't enough 
to uh, cause the problem. A calorie surplus with these foods like alcohol or sugar, like or yeah. uh, or dairy, seem to flare it up a little bit. Um, so it'll be like interesting. I'm gonna go roll back to a mini cut real soon. So here. so back to the caldera for people like what's that? So caldera. Is, I use the serum a, by the way. It's a serum. It's like a skin oil, but the way that it's formulated is it's designed to balance out the microbi microbiome on the skin. Uh, it also it also works with your body's natural uh, ways of healing. So oily skin, dry skin, you know, regardless of the kind of skin you have, the serum balances things out. So you know, we'll get messages from people oily skin that love it. I have oily skin, I love it. People with dry skin, Justin's more on the dry side. He loves it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's not a synthetic product. It's the and the botanicals in there do that. They balance out. I obviously I. I when I travel, I always travel with all of it too. So it's always with me or it's here at the studio. Like I, everywhere I go, I have it for mm -hmm. that exact reason. Um, and when I, my Hampton group buddies, one of the guys has psoriasis. And so I actually gave him my bottles and introduced it to him. And he was like super impressed with like, oh, wow, this wow. is crazy. He thought it had something in it. I'm like, no, that's the beauty of this. Now, it's that's like not an official thing from Calder, everybody. So it's not supposed to be. Oh, for, yeah, yeah. No, I can't claim. You, that's your own personal experience. Yeah, or whatever. It's, it's like, just for skin. I'm probably not supposed to use it on my feet either, but that's a big one no, for I me. I think you can. Yeah, yeah. Well, I use it like on my heels, especially I crack all the time. Oh. And it's been, yeah, making an impact there. Yeah, anywhere sure. where there, I mean, that's what. Yeah. psoriasis you have this kind of scabby dry yeah. skin area and that's really like it's not healing it i'm not claiming there's any properties no, it's, in just it. it. it's just it, what i noticed and if i wasn't doing that i was doing those like a cortisone cream stuff yeah, you know you do that. and that's not i know that's not ideal and i was noticing the same or better benefits with just the caldera and i know that's all natural stuff mm -hmm. and so i'm like um that just has become my go-to it's like i don't even use any of my original stuff from the dermatologist i'm like i'd way rather use something two like times that. now if, when i'm at the gym when i go to the, the the country club one where i'm showering and i'm in the you know afterwards i'm putting stuff two times separate times happens like some guys like hey what are you doing you have really good skin I'm like oh, cool that's yeah, never yeah. happened to me before it's happened <laughs> yeah. two separate times yeah, can yeah. i touch it yeah. no, yeah. no no you can't i mean you it. notice it right away so that's what's kind of cool and the bottle by the way lasts a really long time so yeah two uh, drops one of the other guys that you so there was a couple of these guys that, that i was with that one of the other guy already uses it but he uses it just for his skin and he's like man he's like at first i was like that's kind of expensive but then when i bought the bottle i didn't realize how long that it lasts i'm like yeah i know i thought i said i thought the exact same thing when we officially started working with them i'm like damn that's pretty expensive you're gonna have to find a guy who really cares about his skin to spend that kind of money but then you realize like oh shit like this stuff really yeah, two goes drops oh yeah face. it goes a really long way so do we have a shout out i do uh i want to shout out um our buddy brad jensen who we're about to interview right now so the sober bodybuilder he's got great content um you know, he's, he's part of our circle of friends that, um, you know, uh, were recovering addicts and have like turned their life around for a really long time and have done a lot of really good stuff. He's got really good content. He's been a, a big fan of us and the show for a long time. And uh, this will be the first time that he comes on our show. So if you're not already following him, he's, he's on Instagram. He's the sober bodybuilder. Paleo Valley has the best tasting protein powder I've ever had in my entire life. It's their chocolate bone broth. It tastes like chocolate donuts. By the way, this uh, protein is super easy to digest. If you can't have dairy, if other protein powders make you feel bloated, whatever, this will feel like water. It's high quality collagen protein, bone broth, chocolate. And right now, if you buy one, you get one for free. Go to paleovalley.com forward slash mind pump. All right, back to the show. First question is from Amelia Hartline. How do you gauge appropriate workout intensity? I never get sore, but I have a feeling my workouts are too intense as I have overtraining symptoms. How do you gauge the appropriate dose because I'm scared to, of doing too little? Yeah, this is a great question. Is uh, it possible to do too little? Yeah, I was going to say, start by doing less than what you just did. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, you can, I mean, if you, if you keep doing what you're doing, which may be nothing, then yeah, nothing will change. But yeah, more yeah. than that. Yeah. But I mean, like, we'll okay, so, so one of the things I think this is so important in, a, in, I love when we first shared this study. It was because it was it was even mind blowing for me, even though I knew this, not to this extent, was the amount of training volume you need to keep your mm -hmm. current gains is like one seventh. Yeah. So let's pretend you even were, the best studies show one third. Right. That's so, as, that's the the ones that show the most. So if you trained every day for one hour, so seven days a week, and you're at your body's at a certain point right now. You literally could train one day for one hour to maintain that. Yeah. To put that in perspective. Yeah. So you backing off a few exercises in a workout every time you work out, 
uh, or more or cutting it in half is not going to make you atrophy or go back the other way. If anything, it potentially is going to get closer to the appropriate dose and you might see yourself go yeah. the other direction. So the, so the hard thing with intensity is trying to quantify it. Well, first off, how do you quantify intensity? There's either I do an exercise so I can't yeah. move anymore or I do nothing. How do I quantify all that's in the middle? How do I know if it's appropriate? And, and there's lots of people that have tried to do this. And I think the most, in my experience, the most accurate way to decide this for yourself, because this is also a moving target. Mm -hmm. What may be appropriate intensity today may be too much tomorrow, maybe you know less than appropriate the day after, depending on sleep and mood and your diet and your age. And because your life changes, you change. You're different every single day. You're definitely different every month or every year. So how do I gauge this? This is a good question. And in my experience, the best way to do this is the following. Number one, do I feel better at the end of my workout than I did at the beginning? If you feel better at the end, if you feel more energized, if you feel more invigorated, if you feel more mobile, not exhausted, not like I'm crawling out, not like I'm going to throw up, not like I need to take a nap, but rather I feel like I actually have more energy. I actually feel like my mood is better. I feel like I can move better. That's one. The second one involves soreness. Now, soreness isn't going to tell you much other than you did too much. If you're really sore, uh, and, and the way I define that is you're sore for more than a day or sore to the touch, you definitely did too much. Now, does not being sore mean you're doing the appropriate amount? No. And I'll tell you guys a personal story. The most overtrained I ever got in my entire life was when I got no soreness. I actually, at one point, for some reason thought I'm going to, no matter what, train a double split routine the way Arnold used to do. So I did this in my 20s. I'm like, I'm going to do this. And what I noticed right away were, at first I got really sore and then I had like no sore. I just didn't get sore doing this workout. But my strength kept going down and all the signs of overtraining kept going up, but I didn't get sore. Mm -hmm. So soreness doesn't necessarily tell you much except for maybe that you're doing um, too much. Um, and then look at this. Are you progressing? What do I mean by that? Are you stronger? Mm -hmm. Are you able to do the exercises more effectively? Is the quality of life improving? Do you have more energy for other activities? How was your sleep? Those will all tell you uh, that you're doing the right amount. Um, and, and, and then finally, consider this. If you look at all of your training, 90% of it is going to be cruising. 10% of it is sprinting. Mm -hmm. So, and that's, and that's even for fitness fanatics, even for people who are super fit. If you really look at their training, they really only go super hard. I mean, even 10% of the time is yes. what they're finding in terms of the most effective approach. It's, it's way less in terms of uh, intensity than you'd think. And it's funny because a lot of people have tried to put metrics to this. They've tried to attach devices and HRV right, and right. They, they've really tried hard to like crack the code. Uh, and it's to your point, it's, it's really, it's just like, if you can, be disciplined enough to stop before it's like, I don't have any more. Like I expended it all uh, within that exercise. Like it, just that one mentality alone, I think is going to take you a lot further. This is a good example for whoever this is that's asking this. Uh, you should own MAPS 15 and you should revisit this every time you have this situation. So, and the reason why I say that is because even with all the advice that Sal gave, I think he'd be the first one to admit, as I would admit too, that I still tend to overreach yeah. mm -hmm. because so you, you're talking about people that have been doing this for a really long time, have a really good gauge, yet we still tend to do this. One of the best uh, ways that I teach myself this is by switching to a program like Mass 15 and having that aha moment of, holy shit, I just cut my volume down by like 80%. And I'm literally getting better results. I look better. I feel better. Yeah. I'm stronger. Like that's a duh. So follow it. it, it if, you, if you're not sure and you're trying to figure it out, take whatever program you're doing right now, scrap it for 30 days, follow a MAPS 15 protocol, which I'm guessing is going to be significantly less. 80% of the people listening to this will do best with something like that. Yes. And I, and I bet you, you see at the bare minimum, you don't go backwards. I bet you see progress with a significantly less volume. Yeah. And that's give, and, will give you the gauge of how much were you actually over. And to go a little deeper into this, like, you know, the, the, the reason why overdoing it is so common, there's a lot of reasons why. Uh, insecurity, I, if I'm getting good results, I'll get better results or whatever. But even when you're a fitness fanatic like we are and is, you know, physic, you know, fitness maturity like we have, Here's what happens to us. I said, you want to have more energy at the end of the workout than you did when you get started. Well, here's what it feels like when you're working out. 
you start the workout and you start to feel good. Then you start to feel great. Then I feel amazing and I want to keep chasing this feeling, but what ends up happening is go beyond it. And then I start to get tired. Of, oh, okay. I overdid it. So you, you, you want to end your workout when you feel your best. And that requires a little bit of discipline. But if you do that, you're going to continue to progress at a nice, consistent pace versus overdoing it because the appropriate intensity, the appropriate volume will get you the fastest results. More than that doesn't get you faster results. It actually gets you <coughs> slower results. So this is actually an important question, especially if you're driven uh, by the progress you make in the gym. Next question is from Chelsea Bird. As a 30-plus-year-old female, how realistic is it to achieve and maintain a low enough body fat percentage that showcases abs, leg muscles, defined shoulders, and maintain a healthy hormone profile. Is this possible to maintain without tracking? Unlikely. Uh, Very so, unlikely. Yeah, so there's a body fat. Uh, we all know that too much body fat is unhealthy because that's much more common, right? Obesity is much more common. But too little body fat for too long is also oftentimes unhealthy. And especially for women, especially yep. for women. When women walk around in the teens of body fat, especially lower, for too long, um, you almost always see hormone profile disruption. You almost always see uh, fluctuations uh, in their menstrual cycles. You start to see uh, issues with uh, hot, cold intolerance, sleep issues, libido. Most women, fit women, uh, do well maintaining somewhere between 18 to even as high as 24%. And I'm talking about women who are really consistent with the workouts. You can still be very healthy and be like 27%, 28% body fat. But if you're like a fitness fanatic, you want to hover in that 18 to like 23%, maybe body fat percentage. You start to get lower than that and you stay that way. Almost always you see problems. There's also a, ge a genetic component too that, okay, so uh, Katrina maintains a very low body fat percentage pretty much year round um, and looks really good, but you don't see her abs. She just genetically, some people, their abs will reveal themselves at a higher body fat percentage than others. There's things you can do, like build your abs because they're a muscle. So you could build them to maybe uh, show them or expose them. But there's also a genetic component of how and where you, yeah. you, you hold body fat. And you could have a moderately low or even low body fat percentage like she is. Like she's, Katrina is always in the teens and a lot of times in the mid to low teens. And you don't see her abs. The closest we ever saw was when she's like 9% body fat which is not a place that you want to be as a female for a really long time. So to be shredded to where you see definition in your shoulders and legs uh, for an extended period of time or maintaining, probably not a good place no. for 95% because there's also, the, there are examples, right? Uh, you see these girls on CrossFit sometimes that look like this, like that is more to do with their genetics. Like that, that's also mm. performance and not health yeah. and also not long-term, right? Yeah. Right. Like maximum yeah. I'd like to see how they did long-term, you know, maintain. And they, yeah. none of them have their period, you know, all of them have hormone profile disruption. Uh, most likely. I mean, when I train female athletes, <laughs> it's misleading. I would train female athletes who come to me 15, 16% body fat and they'd struggle getting pregnant. You know, how they, you know how they would get pregnant? Uh, get, get their body fat percentage up to like 18, 19, 20%. And then suddenly they're able to get pregnant. Yeah. It is a, just, it's a terrible, uh, it, this is us comparing ourselves to others, looking at mm -hmm. what other people look like and saying, can, could I do that? Or should I do that? And it's like not a good, healthy place to be, uh, for male or female to be doing that. And I just don't think I, uh, the interesting to me too, not that this person's reason for having abs is for the opposite sex, by anybody, but I personally don't like blocky abs on a chick i just don't think that's attractive i just uh, not that like again my opinion matters but i don't know where this came from this idea of like that's a that's a good look like i don't think that looks sexy by any means that a girl that's shredded shoulders separated what's well, the same thing for guys right you get super shredded and jacked and 99 percent of the time it's a guy that comments like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. look you know yeah again Especially yeah, a lot, lot of women will comment and they'll probably get you know a good boost uh, uh, from yeah. that kind of response but yeah it's I think uh, I think there's just like that idea of like I could do this like it's like some goal or target but it, I don't think realize like you know when you live in that like what that's going to do hormonally and and to your body's health and um, also when you look at the happiness associated with health and fitness because it's very strongly connected right it's not the result or the look that causes the happiness it's the 
it's the journey of fitness. It's the exercise. It's what it does to your, your mental state. It's what it does for your health. It's eating healthy and that help and, and how that affects you. But people tend to think, oh, the happiness that comes from fitness is because you look the way you do. No, no, no. There's very little yeah. happiness yeah. attached to Good. beauty. This is the data shows us quite cl clearly. But it's rather, it's the, it's the journey along the way that causes that happiness. And so you'll get stuck in this really nasty hamster wheel of trying to look a particular way and you'll miss all the incredible values of half, half our jobs tried to highlight that it is fact that there's so many other variables to pay attention to other than your looks. That's right. But yet, uh, as a woman, you know, most typically there's genetic, you know, differences on the outsides, but 18 to 23% body fat's a good fit, lean, healthy body fat percentage. Uh, and your hormones probably won't suffer and you'll feel good. Once you get down to the mid teens, that's when you tend to see problems. Hey, sorry to interrupt. It's October. Maps Muscle Mommy is 50% off, half off. If you're interested, click on the link below. All right, back to the show. Next question is from Arky Drums. Are there any pros or cons for lifting low reps and heavy weight for five to eight reps and mid weight for 10 to 12 reps in the same workout in a push pull leg split? No. No, there is. There's really no. Oh, I, would, I, I can give you some cons. I can give you some cons. There's, well, I think aside from the in terms of like repeatable metrics, yeah, yes, that's yeah. the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. I mean, I just the reason why, I, yeah, that's a con to me. Yeah, you're and, right. And yeah. and, uh, and I definitely can speak to this because this kind of was the way I used to train. I used to the entire workout was a, a blend of all this. Mm -hmm. I had one exercise I'd go really heavy on. Another one I would superset high reps. Another one would be like hypertrophy eight to twelve. And every workout I was switching up and changing up which ones and what I was doing and. This was back when I used to think of the the most important thing was muscle confusion. And I thought the way of muscle confusion worked was confusing the muscles by doing something different all the time, right? And thinking that that was a better way. There's uh, the, What's hard is when you, when you run a program where you're changing reps on different muscle groups and different exercises and you're changing that frequently in your workout, it's very hard to tell uh, and, and also keep track of like, is that like the seventh time in a row I've done that for heavy reps? Is that the, mm. am I, am I getting any stronger in that lift or not? Or oh, wow, I'm feeling really good right now. Is it the high reps that's my body's responding really well? Or is it the low reps that it's responding really well? So yeah, you're not building and developing a real skill yeah. other than like kind of surviving whatever you're presenting your body. That's uh, a, that's a, such a good point, Justin, yeah. because the mentality and skill that goes into and the feel that goes into five reps is very different than in 15 reps. That's right. Yeah. So if I'm training in five reps, there's a different feel I'm looking for, a different intensity, control, output than if I'm doing 15 reps. And uh, the reason why, so if you look at our MAPS program, now now the data, the reason why I said no initially, so if you look at the data, alternating reps in a workout versus doing a block of a rep, you know, count for three weeks and three weeks do another one or whatever. Results wise, it seems to be right around the same. But behaviorally, this is why MAPS programs are phased oftentimes with blocks of rep counts where you know, you're doing five reps for three weeks, then you're doing 10 reps for another three weeks, and there's other changes as well. But the reason that is, is that uh, it's a different mentality, it's a different skill. And I believe you train your skill and, and, and how you should handle the weight as much as you train the muscles. And so my experience for the real world is it's better to focus on one rep. It, the, pr the pro to this is if you're, if you're like, you love it where you're currently at, right? Like, so <laughs> my, my good buddy, uh, uh, Brendan Ayabandejo, uh, ex NFL player owns all the orange theories. Uh, I like to jab at him sometimes because he's obviously drank his own Kool Aid. He, he is in orange theories, running those classes all the time, and uh, and I and he always talks about like his his training and where he's at, and he's always showing his physique off. And I'm like, are you happy where your physique's at? You're not trying to make any more gains or change because whatever you're doing is working. If you want to stay the same, <laughs> and you look great, you know what I'm saying. I always tell him you look great. You know what I'm saying. Like, you don't want to get any bigger. You don't want to like get any stronger or anything like that. And so what you're doing is working because you can change up all these workouts all the time and if you ever been to randomly to an orange theory that's how it is like the workouts are always like a new thing every day uh which is great for somebody who wants to maintain their current fitness level but if you are programming to make change like or body composition change or to get stronger right uh to increase muscle endurance whatever your mm -hmm. desired outcome if you actually are applying this workout to see significant change in your body, you're far better off having a more methodical yeah. approach to how you structure your training blocks and how long you stay with the rep range and how long your rest yeah. period and manipulating that over the periods of time, that will be a far better way. Now, if you are like great shape, you 
look good, you feel good, you move good, you just and, you, have fun. And, and, and then yeah. you just want to have fun. Fucking yeah, that there's a pro to Longevity, that. Is cha- yeah, change sense. it all up. Do every workout weird and random and sets and reps. And there's nothing wrong with that to to, to maintain a, a good physique. I think that's totally okay. But I normally get somebody who asks this question, and then I follow up with what's their goal, and they're like, oh, well, I'd like to put on 15 pounds of muscle, or oh, I like to <laughs> I like to lean out by four or five percent body fat. Well, okay, well if you want to do that, we'd be better off running a structured program that we can actually measure the results and actually be more timely about how we change things up versus just You know, and what this also speaks to is a lot of people don't realize that workout programming is very important. And so when you don't realize that rep counts are interchangeable, it's just mm-hmm. a means to an end. Exercises, they're just body parts that we're training. So this one works the same body parts as that one. It's not that big of a deal. Exercise order doesn't matter. Tempo doesn't matter. It's all working out. No, 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 it all matters. And when you program properly, if you look at really good, you know, programming with strength training in particular, it tends to follow in blocks. It tends to follow in phases. And that's just because it works better. It just works better that way. Next question is from G Snyder. What are your thoughts on pausing the use of a GLP-1 for a couple of weeks to do a mini bulk and then get back on the GLP-1? My calories have dropped really low, and I'm wondering if interrupting the large deficit with little bulk would keep me right on track. So I, we, we're first, not a doctor. We exactly. So we have to say we're not we, a have, doctor. Yeah, <laughs> we, we cannot recommend dosage of GLP ones, when to use it, how much to use it, when to stop, or any of that stuff. But I think what's important about this question to address is the challenge that people are going to run into with GLP ones yep. and how important it is to understand that set yourself up. you just drop your calories real low for whatever reason. Either you willed it to happen or a GLP-1 took your appetite away, okay? The, your body adapts to that. Now, you'll lose some weight and you'll lose some muscle with that, especially if you don't strength train and follow some precautions to maintain muscle. You'll lose weight. Then your metabolism will adapt to what you're taking in, and now you're screwed. So your goal was to lose 60 pounds. You lost 30. Got 30 more to go, but I'm eating 1,000 calories a day. What do I do now? Up my dose and go to 500 calories? I can't even sustain, I won't be able to get enough nutrients at 500 calories. That's dangerous. So what do I do? Well, here's what you do. You reverse. You go in the opposite direction. You increase your calories, raise your protein, and strength train. And I think with GLP-1s, this is going to be the big challenge. I think, mm-hmm. and we know this, we, we have a group that we work with, 50 people in there. Very and common. Very common. They have these crazy hard plateaus yeah. at like 1,200 calories. And I've been at the same low calories for six months. I haven't lost a single pound anymore. It's like, we got to yeah. move you out of that, get your metabolism to speed up so we can you know, start the fat loss process again. So since Sal covered our ass by saying we're not doctors and we can't recommend this, I'm going to say this is what I would do if I was doing this uh, and did whatever I wanted to do. I would use the GLP-1 to break that those hedonistic desires towards foods. Most people that want to get on a GLP-1 have a significant m- amount of body fat they want to lose. Normally, that has something to do with some sort of relationship or connection to food or alcohol or something that they have overeaten themselves to that weight. And what is what has been shown with that GLP one is the it's the, how powerful it breaks that connection. Mm-hmm. So I would use that to make that initial break from that food, that thing that I was driving towards, to start to create new good healthy behaviors around that. And whether that took four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, twelve weeks, whatever that takes to get there to lose that initial weight to break those habits, then I would come off of it. And then I would reintroduce a better like eating habit around whatever was happening. So if it was like ice cream for me, I've shared that, you know, now that's Greek yogurt, a high protein Greek yogurt and granola at nighttime, right? Is now been inserted there instead of the ice cream and go on a mini bulk where I'm trying to get strong. I'm hitting my protein intake and I would do that. And that's how I would use something, a tool like this. If it was me doing the call, yes, we're not doctors. We can't tell everybody how to use this stuff. But what we have found in this group is exactly what the guy said is we are having these people that have this initial success because it cuts their calories in half. And then what ends up happening is they have a hard plateau and you know, the, the inevitable has to happen. They need to reverse diet. They need to rebuild their metabolism. And a lot of them can't do it on the generic dose that a lot of these GLP- Because they don't have the appetite. Yeah, there seems to be this misunderstanding of that it's like some kind of fat burning. Uh, I've talked to to some of my friends and people are interested in it. And it's like, it seems to be this misconception that like, yes, it'll 
kind of crush and curb appetite, but also it has this like fat burning effect to it, yeah. which is not the case. Like this is just something that you have to be really on top of like the nutrients and really making sure like you're, you're in this in order to better your behaviors and your, your habits around food. And this is an opportunity yeah. that you have and you need to grab it and, you know, really take the reins. The, d- the data shows that GLP ones, um, in- improve insulin sensitivity that probably uh, is better for you from a mitochondrial standpoint. It probably does assist, and the data seems to show this, in fat loss. It probably has some pro-muscle health effects, and there's some other interesting things as well. But a, a lot of the effects are because you just eat a lot less calories. But it comes with its own challenges. One of the challenges is uh, how do we keep you from losing muscle? Mm-hmm. Because if you lose muscle, your metabolism slows down, you're going to be in a bad place. And why would you want to lose muscle anyway? You're less mobile, less strong, and less muscle almost always, unless you're this massive bodybuilder, right? It almost always means you're less healthy. Too much body fat is unhealthy. Too little muscle is equally as unhealthy. And so the challenge is going to be for a lot of people is, well, I'm, I eat very little now. I don't have an appetite to eat more. I want to get muscle. I want to strength train. But it's I'm not it's not working. Why isn't it working? I'm lifting weights. You're not eating enough. You don't have enough nutrients to fuel uh, any kind of muscle building. Um, so we need to eat more. Well, I can eat more. It's funny because some of the conversations with people on GLP ones remind me of conversations I would have with teenage boys who were skinny and and, and couldn't eat more food and wanted to gain muscle. Yeah. Remember those? Yeah. yeah. It was like you're trying to come up with tricks to get them to eat more calories. Well, you know, drink some milk with your meals and maybe try some shakes. I'm telling people who used to struggle with weight who were yeah. obese. I'm giving them these tricks to get more calories because the GLP one is taking their appetite so much. I know. It's like you so just it's, flip the coin and they have the other problem. It's it's so weird. So uh, and and by the way, hearing us talk about this, there's this initial knee jerk reaction that some professionals give, like, and this is why it's so bad. Well, listen, no, 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 no. There is also this. It's a tool. There exactly. There are a lot of people that. Um, I mean, we just had a great conversation with a friend of ours that battled with like drug addiction, right? And there's people that have an addiction to food. That they can, they are just, they can't, they can't break away. Mm-hmm. And they've tried every diet, they've tried every intervention, and every time they do, they fail and go mm-hmm. back and they binge. And they have got a lot of demons around this. And this is what's been so breakthrough about this GLP one is it gives those people a breath of fresh air. That mm-hmm. person who's white knuckling it every time when they're dying to get it. Takes it, the just, grip off of it. Them takes it takes it. It takes it away and it's magical. Now that doesn't mean that the work isn't done yet, right? That's just that's a, just a huge relief for some people. But then the next step becomes, okay, how do we solve what what was causing this addiction and, and what how can we create new behaviors? But man, that can be life-changing for some people that have been battling their entire life with this. And so I'm very pro what this thing is capable of and how it can help a lot of people. Do I think there's tons of abuse? Do I think there's tons of people that shouldn't be doing it? Absolutely. But that's not my job as a, as a coach and a trainer is not to judge these people. It's to help these people through this process. And there is a way that this can really help a lot of if people. If you use it, Absolutely. if you're if you're the right person for it and you're using it and you're combining it with proper and appropriate strength training, a high protein diet, you're not using, you're not destroying your appetite. So you're not just eating almost nothing. Um, and you're working with behavior modification through the process. I think it could be a very valuable tool. If it's just something you take and this is it and you do yeah, nothing passively, else with it, yeah, no. you're going to solve some problems and cause other problems is, is my strong opinion. All right. I know you liked that episode. If you did, check this one out. 30% body fat. For men, this is way too high. This is actually a bit high for women as well. So in today's episode, we're talking about how you can go from 30 to 10. What is 10% body fat? This is when you have a visible six pack. Can you go from 30 to 10%? Yes, it's possible but not if you guess along the way. So we're going to talk about how you can do that in today's episode. Now, there's a huge range, right, of like body types. Yes. Some people can run uh, a little bit heavier uh, and, or a little bit higher.